So we've been in this uh, series of uh, uh, lessons from uh, Nehemiah, this character in the Old Testament who was the uh, poison taster for the king of what we know as uh, Iran, and um, King Artaxerxes. And uh, he heard that uh, his home uh, city of uh, Jerusalem was destroyed and falling down and a mess, and uh, people were discouraged and hard where they'd come back from uh, exile, and now their lives were still ruined, and they were ashamed and threatened and all those things. So he got seriously depressed, which worried the king, and the king said, how can I help you? And pretty soon the king gave him wood and supplies and authority and an army to protect him and help and everything, and time off to go and help rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. So he does this, and then they're going along, and it's been, it's been really fascinating for me, but one of the things that uh, um, I've learned in this is that just like in our own lives, the uh, the, re, the undercurrent, the undertow, never stops. You know, it's like swimming in the beach. You're going, it's a beautiful day at the beach, and the sun's shining, everything. But I'm being pulled out to sea to my death. So, you know, it's kind of like that. There's sort of an undertow all along that we deal with. So I've been thinking about this, and uh, today we're going to do something a little different. We're going to be a little bit in Chapter 6 and a little bit in Chapter 9. Um, and the title of this message in my head was, a recipe for failure and a recipe for success. But I just couldn't bring myself to put the second part of that up on the board, you know? So it's just a recipe for failure. <laughs> but, but I am gonna get to the other side. Now, um, anyone here ever cook anything? <laughs> and I don't mean just that microwave popcorn stuff. I mean, I'm telling you, anybody ever cook, right? Okay. See, I have something that's uh, very um, obsolete. I have boxes of cookbooks. I don't even open them anymore because you know if you go on your phone you can just <laughs> type in the name of whatever you're cooking and there's a thousand recipes for it. So, uh, but nobody's touching my cookbooks. <laughs> anyway, I, I actually love cooking and uh, and I uh, done, uh, it, this is the bitter thing, okay? When Eileen was, uh, after our 16th anniversary, Eileen said, I'm not cooking anymore. I'm done. I quit. You can either cook, starve to death, or go to McDonald's. That's your choice. <laughs> I didn't like McDonald's. <laughs> so, anyway, but then the irony was she went and published a cookbook with Better Homes and Gardens, and she doesn't even cook. That's just wrong. That's so wrong. Okay. So, uh, recipe for failure. With a recipe, you have certain elements, and you put them together, you mix them all up, and you bake them, and pretty soon you've got something. Okay? So, if you want failure, or you want to be weak, or you want your life not to work well, I have the recipe for you. Isn't that exciting? I, I'm recommending you write this down because you know you may not find it on your phone if you uh, type it in. Uh, chapter 6, Chris uh, led us through that last week, and it's a great chapter because it's filled with uh, sinister manipulation, uh, deception, uh, malice, Betrayal, all the things that make life great, you know, and uh, and so just to remind you, uh, when word came to Sam Ballot, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, the rest of the enemies that I that I'd rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, though at that time we we had not set the doors at the gates. Uh, Sam Ballot and Geshem sent me a message: Come, let's meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono but they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers with this reply, I'm carrying on a great project, I can't go down there. Uh, why should the work stop while I leave it and go down and visit you? Four times they sent the same message. Each time I gave them the same answer. And it goes on and on about what happens here. So in this recipe, I wanna start with, if, uh, and uh, you know I like Cajun food, right? I'm kind of the rain man of, Southern Louisiana cooking. I, I like Cajun. And uh, so actually this recipe would work with the Cajun man uh, if you do the right accent. It involves distraction, <laughs> confusion, disillusion, and resignation. Let's see if you just do that with every T-I-L-N, that's what you get with Cajun man. Okay, so uh, the first one is distraction. Now, 
this first element, you take a, a couple of cups of distraction in your life, and it can be very, very potent. It can be very flavorful. And it's interesting that when um, these uh, underminers of the work and of Nehemiah, when they weren't able to succeed with direct confrontation, they weren't able to succeed with uh, full-on assault. They weren't able to, uh, to succeed with so many things. What do they come down to? Distraction. Get down off the wall. You've been working really hard. Let's meet. And uh, I think that distraction may be one of the things that undermines us as we uh, try to follow Christ in our life and, and live our lives purposefully and meaningfully and uh, in healthy ways. It's so easy to fall prey to distraction, isn't it? Yeah, I think about this because, um, well, I have really severe ADHD, <laughs> so I understand distraction. It, uh, in fact, let me talk to you about this. Oh, wait, no. <laughs> I'm like the Ritalin boy, the poster boy for Ritalin. And, uh, and one of the things that has haunted me all my life is I am so easily distracted. <laughs> and, and what I found is I can be really distracted by what seem like good things and it gets me totally off course and I'm going but how can that be bad because it seemed like a good thing so here you have Nehemiah who's trying to do the work and he's resisted all the assaults and the problems and everything like that and now he gets an invitation to go and meet with the enemies and I think to myself as a pastor, oh, they want to meet. Well, wait, let's take some time and do that. That'll be a good thing. Maybe God's in it. Let's go see. Wouldn't you want to do that? Maybe something good can come out of this. However, I've actually found that nothing good ever comes out of it. Because suddenly, instead of uh, following the priorities and the commitments that that uh, Jesus has put out in front of us we're now pursuing our own boy you know maybe they'd like me or maybe I could win them over or maybe blah 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 blah, blah. maybe something good and we're distracted and I'm not saying all distractions are bad uh, this one would have ended badly evidently because they were going to try and kill him but um, I understand that <laughs> being a pastor but um, the thing is that uh, even if they seem good, they get us off course. And, it's, and we lose our focus, and we lose our vision, and we lose our uh, momentum. And so the first uh, ingredient in a recipe for failure is to allow ourselves to be drawn away with distractions. Now, <clears throat> the second one, though, is... Um, so it's a very important one because it, it actually goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And that is um, confusion. You put in a couple of cups of confusion into your recipe following distraction, and it gets potent. It'll start bubbling. Now, in the Garden of Eden, when, uh, when the, the Bible tells us that, that Eve was being uh, tempted, right, um, by the serpent. Okay, remember this? Uh, what was it that the serpent said? It was, a, it was brilliant, really. What, what the serpent said to her is, didn't God say... Right? That was, the, that was the question. Didn't God say, you're not to even touch the fruit of this tree. You're not even supposed to go near it. Didn't God say that? And she went, I didn't think so, but maybe so. I don't know. Might be. What did God say? I'm not sure what God said now. Maybe that was. Yes, yes, that sounds like it. That's probably what God might have said. Yes, yeah, so actually it wasn't. The question that Eve was asked in the temptation was not about anything that God had said. It was a twist and a distortion, right? And so, but Eve went, oh yeah, okay, that sounds right, yeah. And it's amazing how much confusion we can get because uh, things come at us that sound like maybe they could be right. Maybe that's the way it could be. Oh, you know, 
you know, maybe I misunderstood God. And you know, really the Bible does say fish and visitors smell after three days. <laughs> I've heard that my whole life. That's why I make the visitor sleep with the fish. <laughs> but, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness. Didn't God say that in his word? The pastor's always right. <laughs> Didn't God say it? I mean, I'm just testing you here, okay? I'm playing, I'm playing with it now, okay? But, but the thing is, there's so many things that you go, well, maybe, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, I think. Maybe. Could be. And, and so when we start getting it, pretty soon we, we look at things and we, and we become confused. And we're no longer clear about, about God's word. We're not clear about uh, Jesus' love for us. We're not clear for God's intentions in our life and his, and his desire to lead us forward as his people. We're not clear about that anymore because these other things sound possible. That's why so, so many people who, who uh, uh, have a relationship with God, they get diverted off into little sects and and uh, cults and uh, manipula manipulation situations because they go, well, it, it sounded right. It, it was close. And, and I don't know a heresy that doesn't start with something that sounds pretty true. Every heresy starts with, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then the bobsled ride starts. But, um, so, so you have distraction lose our focus, and then our mind starts working with us and we become confused. Now, you can't cook that, so let me give you another one. Disillusion. This is an interesting ingredient because it doesn't take very much disillusionment. It's just a little pinch, really. It's a very, very potent ingredient. But a little pinch of disillusionment and you start to say, this isn't turning out the way I thought it would. This isn't happening the way I expected. People aren't responding the way I had anticipated. You all know, when I, when I was younger, I, uh, I believe that if we would accept Christ into our life, turn our life over to him, and let him be the Lord of our life, everything would work out so well, and it'd be so smooth, and we'd be prosperous. You know, I would love to be one of those, you know, a name it and claim it preachers, you know, and lay hands on that Mercedes and pray for it, it'll be yours, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't you like that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just wanted everything to be good, you know, and if I'm a Christian, it ought to be good. I started getting handfuls of disillusionment early on when I went, I must have this wrong because I, my life's still a mess. Uh, I got problems. Uh, girls don't like me. <laughs> I was young, you know. So, no, it's the same now, you know. But um, the thing is that um, it's easy to become disillusioned. And we start thinking, oh, I got this wrong. Maybe I misunderstood. It doesn't work for me. Maybe following Jesus works for others, but it doesn't really work for me. And now the recipe for failure is starting to thicken. We become distracted, get confused, and then just a little bit disillusioned. I thought it would be better than this. kind of a golf fan and I, years ago there was a guy who was number one in the world not Tiger not before Tiger number one in the world and uh, great golfer his father was a professional golfer he was too uh, 
and he was winning the British Open. And I remember watching on television, they had a thing there where you, in the last hole of the British Open, all the fans gather around the person and in a horde, they walk up the 18th fairway together, just like a giant stampede of people. And um, uh, his caddy reported later that as they were walking up the 18th for him to win the British Open, he leaned over to the caddy and said, I thought this would feel better. And he never won again. Ever. He couldn't hit a golf ball after that. Day. I thought it would feel better. How many times have we been involved in situations in life and we, and we go, oh, I thought, I thought it'd be better. I thought it would be different. And we start to get disillusioned, and, and then the things begin to drift away. The last part of this recipe for failure is uh, it's, it's simple because it's almost inevitable, but it's the, it's the uh, if Cajuns ate cake, it would be the icing on the Cajun cake, which would be odd because it would be a pepper cake, but um, <laughs> with shrimp in it. But it's kind of odd, <laughs> but it's resignation. We give up. Why try? Why try? And we walk away. I, you know, I, over the years, I've had a lot of years in this, but people that are, were good friends of mine and uh, brothers and sisters in the faith, and they, they were far more faithful to me. They prayed harder and they were more biblical and they nicer people, all those things, you know. Yeah, that was easy. And, and, uh, and I go, what happened to them? Where did they go? And somewhere along the line, they stirred this recipe and resigned from their faith. They just bleh, walked away. And that's when the recipe for failure really kicks in. We give up. We go, well, God's not using me. God can't do this. I can't trust God. I don't know what's going to happen. Boom. Why try? And we give up. Now, Usually, because I'm a negative person, I would stop right there, but today I'm not going to. You're not getting away that easy because I want us to do a recipe for success, okay? So get out your pencils. We're going to do this. Recipe for success, chapter 9. Big celebration. Um, the, uh, all the people gather, and uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but parts of it. And they bring uh, their uh, prophet, Ezra, uh, and uh, he gets up uh, above the crowd and, and he's uh, talking to them and he begins uh, to talk to them. And he says to the Lord in a prayer, Blessed be your glorious name. May you be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens and all the starry host and the earth and all that's in it and the seas and all that's in them. You gave life to everything and the multitudes of heaven worship you. You're the Lord God who chose Abraham and brought him out. Uh, and it, it goes on and on and on. You saw the suffering of our forefathers in Egypt. You heard their cry at the Red Sea. You sent miraculous signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against his officials. Where you knew how arrogantly the people were treating them. You divided the sea before the people. He goes through the whole wandering in the wilderness. And then he says, but they, our forefathers, became arrogant and stiff-necked and didn't obey you. They refused to listen and failed to remember the miracles you performed among them. <clears throat> uh, they became stiff-necked in their rebellion. They appointed a leader in order to return to their slavery. But you're a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. Therefore, you did not desert them. Even when they made for themselves an image of a calf and said, this is our God that brought us out of Egypt, and they committed awful blasphemies, but because of your great compassion, you did not abandon them. You led them. You get, anyway, it goes on and on and on. <clears throat> so what's a recipe for success? Um, ironically, it could still be um, Cajun. The first one... Observation. Observation. The first ingredient, if you took a handful of observation in your life and threw it in the, <coughs> in the uh, 
frying pan. How different would that be? See, most of us go through life, the reason we're confused and distracted is that we, we're not so good about the observation. We don't see what's around us. And so Ezra starts with this real clear observing. He's not just saying, oh God, spirit of the universe, Lord of all, all. He goes very specific. This is what you did. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heaven, not just the lower heavens, and all the starry hosts, and the earth, and all that's in the earth, and the seas, and all that's in them, and you gave life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. And then he got real specific. You chose Abraham, brought him out of Ur of the Chaldees, and named him, and brought his heart, uh, and you found his heart faithful to you. You made a covenant with him. He gets very, very specific in his observations. How often do we miss out because we generalize? We just have this kind of, yeah, there's a God up there, and we're down here, and stuff's going on, and who knows? Well, maybe there's life in the details. Maybe there's health in the details. And I don't mean, you know, we all need to become obsessive compulsive disorder, but, but we do need to start observing and recognizing and, uh, and acting on what we see. So for example, for me, when I, uh, you walk through uh, hard times with me when I was uh, very discouraged and um, uh, on a fast track to being a bitter old man, you know, um, now I'm just an old man, but, but I'm not a bitter one, you know. And, uh, and, and the thing is that changed me was that I had to go against my natural instincts and willfully, almost violently, force myself to find things to be grateful for, to be thankful for. And I couldn't think of anything because all I saw was what I was unhappy with, what seemed wrong. And it was so hard for me to be thankful. And people would ask me, so are you thankful? And I go, yes, in general, <laughs> which means nothing, you know. And so I, I'd be like driving down the road, and I'd go, okay, I've got to think of something to be thankful for. I can't think of anything. I cannot think of anything. Well, I'm not thankful for the guy who's tailgating me, I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> but, you know, and, uh, and then I go, okay, here, there, okay, that tree, okay, that tree, thank you, Lord, for that tree. I know it's a very pretty tree, the branches, okay, thank you for that. That was all I got. I mean, it was so remedial. I was just stupid. And, uh, and then pretty soon, you know, I started seeing other things and going, well, I can be thankful for that. I can be thankful for them. I can be thankful for this. But it took actually training myself late in life to start observing what was around me that was worthy of, of things. And, and then I had to do that exercise where every day I had to write a thank you letter to someone. It almost killed me. <laughs> oh my goodness. You know. Every day. But you know what? I began to appreciate you. I began to go, wow, I've got a lot to be thankful for. And then I started to think, I'm blessed. And I, and I actually watched myself come out of my bitter cycle of uh, failure and I and I came out of it and went I am blessed now did my life tangibly change no <laughs> that's a funny thing but I started to observe and see it and, and it was hard at first because I'm not used to doing that I'm used to just vaguely writing off everybody but um, it was the first recipe start the second one resolution Observation, resolution. Um, so resolution. Now, I, uh, when, you, when I think of resolution, for the most part, I would think of it as, okay, it's over now, right? It's resolved. This problem, it's over. We've finished it. It's resolved. But that's not what this talks about. Resolution is... Well, two weeks ago, I went and had my eyes examined. They should have examined my head, but they did my eyes. And, uh, and they would click these little lenses in in front of me at the, at the Costco eye person, you know? And I'm sitting there and I go, which is, which is brighter? Which is better? Which is clearer? You know, and I'm, oh. And, uh, and each time they put a new lens in front of my eye, it would get resolved. It would come into focus. 
there was resolution until they finally came up with the glasses. I'm sorry, are these them? I don't know if these are them or the old ones. You know, <laughs> I can't tell. But, but, um, but the thing is that um, without these glasses, y'all don't exist to me. Simple as that. I'm just up here talking to some blurred colors. <laughs> That's all. And uh, uh, things are pretty vague and uh, not much resolution. But guess what? If I did this, whoa! I, it resolves and I see you clearly. Wouldn't it be weird if we had glasses that we could put on, maybe Walt's wear some, that, that you put on that you can see not just the person, but you can see into their emotions, their struggles, their dreams, their hopes, their fears, their failures, their, their possibility, all of those things. Could you imagine putting on glasses and have the kind of resolution that you can see into people and know their hearts? That's resolution. And we can love each other regardless. We know all this stuff about each other and we, and we choose to love each other regardless because we, we see right in there and we see people the way God sees them. That's resolution. You ever stare at the sun? I, I'm not recommending this, children. <laughs> no. uh, don't stare at the sun, but I used to look at the sun and it was like this big bright spot, you know? Well, you don't, oh, you're in Seattle, you never saw it. I'm sorry. <laughs> See, I was from San Diego. We saw it, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, well, I'm just talking to people who don't know what this means, but there was a sun up there, and uh, you could look at it, and it's just kind of a bright light. So in college, I, I so what was I thinking? I signed up for an astronomy class at San Diego State. And you know, they're showing us slides of the universe and all this stuff, you know, da, 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 da. And then we had a field trip. We had to go to the uh, Palomar Observatory. And uh, the uh, teacher wanted us to look at sunspots. And I go, I, I don't know. When you look through the telescope at the sun, it's so different because it resolves. You have resolution and you can actually see like explosions and fire blowing up off the surface of the sun and all this stuff. And, and all of a sudden it's just an alive surface that you can see. Uh, it's an amazing thing. Now, don't go to Costco and get glasses and then stare at the sun. That's not going to do it. You need the telescope. But, but the point is that when things become resolved, you have clarity of vision that is unbelievable. And, uh, and I think that's part of the recipe for success. We see things and then we begin to um, see things real clearly. So for example, Ezra starts talking about what God has done, what God has done, what God has done. He's observing all those things. Then he shifts to resolution and talks about what really happened with the people. How they responded in unfaithfulness. How they responded in defiance. How they uh, responded in passivity. And he, and he goes through all of these things of resolving so that everyone in the audience knew what God did and what the people did. And they could see it clearly. Then, get to the third ingredient for success, um, dedication. And you see this here in chapter 9. Um, after all of that observing and focusing and all those things, verse 38. In view of all this, uh, the people say this, we are making a binding agreement. We're putting it in writing. And our leaders, our priests, are affixing their seals onto it. And then they have the names in chapter 10 of all the uh, people who sealed it, put their names on it. We're making a commitment. We've seen what God does. We've seen, we understand what God, we've observed God's handiwork. And we've seen how in the past there's been a failure to respond. But we're going to dedicate ourselves. We're going to have dedication be different and to go forward from here differently. Isn't that cool? To, to say this is a new beginning. This is a new start. It doesn't matter what's happened before because we have forgiveness and, and, and God's love and power and His presence in our life. We can start today dedicating ourselves for this new beginning.
we're going to follow him with faithfulness. We're, we're going to observe. We're going to focus. We're going to understand what's happening. We're not going to be distracted and confused. We're going to dedicate ourselves to move forward. Sometimes I feel like we need to do that every day. You know? Uh, it's not like... I accepted Christ in my life when I was in third grade, so therefore I'm, I'm a Christian, so I don't need to think about it anymore. I think, wow, I need to do that a lot. Lord, whew, kind of gone my way here. I need you to come in again and get this thing going, you know, and, and I need to follow. And it's, a, and it's a commitment to say we're resolved at this point that we're going to move forward. And, and we will follow you. And, and that moment of dedication, I, I love the fact that they say, we're going to write this down and we're going to sign it. We want, we want the witnesses to sign it. We want all this to happen so that we agree that this has happened at this point. Now, I would stop there. And I know some of you are wishing I would, but there actually is one more. And that is activation. Activation, if you're Cajun. But... Um, Sometimes we make the dedication and we, th we think we're going forward and that's the end of it. I can't tell you how, I mean, I've done probably, you know, 800 weddings or something over the years and uh, sometimes to the same people uh, and uh, that's happened. And, uh, and they really look back and say, okay, from this day we're married. Ta-da! And I, I always tell them the same thing, which is, you know, every single day you got to decide you want to be married because <laughs> it's so easy to not. You know, and there has to be a, a dedication, a rededication, and then and people often. I wish that I found that no premarital counseling works before the marriage. Everybody goes, yeah, 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 yeah you're a pastor, you're, you're negative, you know, you need possibility thinking. You know, we're happy, we love each other, and I'm thinking, why am I even meeting with these people before the wedding? I ought to meet with them like six months after the wedding and they're going to be going oh why didn't you tell us <laughs> oh if only we knew oh man now we're ready to listen <laughs> so you know uh it's true um <laughs> but uh yeah we spent the first 18 years in marriage counseling <laughs> you know that obviously doesn't help so <laughs> just keep going <laughs> but um you know the thing is that um Activation is the living out of what we've dedicated. It's the implications of doing that. And uh, I, I uh, ran into this uh, about two weeks ago. I had to get a landline. You know, I'm, the, I'm becoming a guy in the 90s. You know, I had to get a landline because uh, with the book, uh, I'm doing radio interviews around the country, and stations will not interview someone on a cell phone. Ta-da! I didn't know that. I could lean out the bathroom window and get better reception, you know, and talk to But, um, uh, so they wanted a landline. So I thought, okay, how do I do this? You know, and I struggled. And, um, went to Fred Meyer and bought a phone, you know, and all that stuff. It's, sat it there on the wall, nothing happened. And, uh, I, I went down to Comcast. Their, their building, their store thing, you know, and I talked to people there. I said, I need to get a landline. They signed me up. We got the contract. They showed me everything. They gave me a bag with a bunch of stuff in it and uh, went home, put the bag in the garage, and <laughs> waited. <laughs> Couldn't get the phone to work. Could not get it to work. I mean, it's unbelievable, right? Smart guy like me, nothing. I mean, I'm ready to go back to Fred Meyer and turn the phone in for another one because obviously this one's broken. It doesn't work at all. And I even signed up at Comcast. Uh, how about Bill? I, they charged me you know, installation fees, all these things. Nothing. Can't call out. Can't call in. Can't get a message. Nothing. I can't even get a dial tone. So I went back to Comcast. They said, well, our computer says you never activated it. <laughs> well, what's that? Remember I told you to call this number at the bottom of the receipt? Oh, I'm supposed to call that number? Yeah. So I call the number, and they go, tell us about your modem. And I read the one I had, and they went, we don't have that modem. That's not one of ours. And I go, well, that's what I got. They go, would you look around the house, sir, and see if there's a bag 
with stuff in it from Comcast? And then call us back? No kidding, I found it in the garage. There was a modem in there, and all the stuff and everything, you know? <laughs> and then they, you know, they, you know, anyway, they, they pushed a few buttons and everything. Ring. I've got a landline. But if I never activated it, it would, I've been paying the bill. I've been, I have a nice phone there. It would look really nice. No radio station would get through to me. I even had a number. They gave me a number, you know, that I could give to people. But it took activation, and I think the same thing in our in our in our faith. We we, we say, okay, Lord, I'm gonna, I'm gonna follow you, new day, blah 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 blah. But if we don't put that in the tangible steps, we're never gonna follow Jesus by putting our Bible in the garage in a bag and sitting there waiting for God to do wonders in our life, right? So you laugh at me because you go, well, he is so stupid. I can't believe he did it. And now I'm laughing at you going, hey, a lot of you are pretty stupid because you haven't activated your faith yet. <laughs> Not saying who. You know, I'm just saying. You know, it, it works both ways. The deal is we need to take some steps. It's not enough to say, oh, this is what I think about Jesus. The question is, what are we doing about what we think about Jesus? That's the issue. So, you got a recipe for failure, you got a recipe for success. And I'm not going to tell you which one to make. I'm going to leave that up to y'all. You can make whichever one you want. And if you really want a mess, mix all eight ingredients together. <laughs> Distraction, dedication, resolution, dissolution. You know, you can do that too. That's a big mess. But observe it. Resolve it, focus it, dedicate, and activate. And you got a recipe for success. And health, and strength, and faith. So pray with me. Lord, we love you. And we do want to follow you with faith. And we want to be your healthy people, your strong people. We want to be people who, who know you and recognize your hand in our lives. And, and a grateful people. So give us the courage not to wander off distracted or give up the disillusionment. Help us to step forward and do what you call us to do and to be who you call us to be. In every situation, we'll give you the glory. Amen. Amen.